took about 60 years, but we finally got a canon backstory for Una. Only slightly longer than it took for her to get an actual first name. Hello interwebs and welcome to my review of the third episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds, this one titled Children of Illyria. As per usual, I'll get my spoiler-free overview thoughts up front and then we'll get into specific spoilers in the back. But staying spoiler-free, this episode just continues this series' record of knocking it out of the park. We are three for three, at least in my opinion, of great episodes of this show. As I kind of joked about, this is very much an Una-focused episode, which I was very excited to see because she is one of the oldest characters in Star Trek canon, right up there with Spock and Pike himself, and yet we know probably the least about her of any of the legacy characters coming into this show. And while her backstory has been developed in novels and things like that, including a lot of the stuff that they drew upon for this episode that I won't spoil too much for you because it is a spoiler what that backstory is, but it was nice to see a lot of that canonized and a lot of that get to actually be shown for the first time in live action, really fleshing out this character. And Rebecca Romaine does a phenomenal job not only handling the weight of the storylines that she's given, but also showing us that she's a competent commander because for most of the storyline, Pike is sidelined off the Enterprise with Spock, and so she gets to be the head of the ship. And just like any good first officer, she is just a competent, strong commander, and yet also wrestling with her own internal struggles that relate to the situation at hand. And I think it all just wonderfully weaves throughout the episode. And the storyline itself is really unique as well, but kind of builds off of what I'm starting to see as a trend for this show. Because one of the things that I've been noticing with each episode of this series so far is that it's taking a kind of time-honored classic Trek story like the Prime Directive in the first episode. And with this one, we're talking about the sort of ban against genetic modifications that we saw way back in Star Trek The Original Series, going back to the episode Space Seed and Khan, Noonie, and Singh. And while you'd expect that concept to be brought up with the character of La'an, Noonie, and Singh, and we'll talk about her in a little bit, and it does get brought up a little bit with her context, the actual storyline here is really focusing on a group of aliens and a medical mystery surrounding them that has to deal with that exact topic. And what I'm liking this show for doing is not only is it taking these Star Trek classic storylines, like ones that go back to the original series, but also adding to them, adding greater depth to them, and subtly critiquing the ways that they've been used in the franchise. It's not going around saying like, this sucks and the franchise was awful or something like that, but it's sort of taking what the franchise showed us, like the prejudice against genetic modification that we saw going back to the original series, and like adding layers to it of how it's much more complex than that, adding nuance to it, and adding nuanced stories to it that, that directly address some very, again, subtle but biting critique of ways that things present today, namely around bigotry. Because that's what this episode ultimately becomes. Without getting into too much spoilers, this is an episode about bigotry and prejudice, and how prejudice and bigotry works. And in classic Star Trek fashion, it's using a weird alien metaphor to tackle how those things present themselves in human society today. But I also really love this show in that it doesn't just sort of leave it at metaphor, but in like Grand Trek tradition of episodes like Measure of the Man, which directly linked like Data's dehumanization in the next generation to racism and slavery in that episode, this episode directly calls out that this is about prejudice that we face today. And so I'm just really liking this show, still staying with the alien metaphor of Star Trek and critiquing Star Trek storylines, but not making the mistake of letting it stay allegorical where people could miss it, but saying like, no, this thing we're talking about an alien allegory, it is directly talking about this. And I just so appreciated that. And then two other things to talk about with this episode is number one, I was really worried that this storyline was going to be kind of like the naked time or the naked now that we saw in the original series and Next Generation in that those are great episodes. Well, Naked Now is not a great episode of Next Generation, but Naked Time is a great episode of the original series. But the problem with those episodes is that they feature the crew kind of acting strange and weird and out of character type which we start to see a little bit here with the sickness that's going around the ship, with characters kind of acting out of character as a result. But the problem with those episodes is that they appeared very early in those series runs, and so we hadn't really established the characters yet. And so because we hadn't established the characters yet when Picard or Kirk or Spock or Sulu were acting out of character, it didn't work as well because we didn't know the characters enough yet to really feel how that much they were acting out of character. But this episode avoids that because while we do have some characters acting out of type, and I won't spoil which ones, the main focus on Una 
never allows her to shift character, but allows us to question her character and come to terms with understanding who she is as a person. So it uses these sort of out of character moments in order to highlight the character of the person in general. So I loved that, that it was sort of taking these classic Trek storylines like Naked Time and Naked Now, but putting them in a new way that actually stayed on the character instead of drawing away from the character. But finally, on top of that, one of the last things, and I'll talk about this more in my spoiler filled section, is that the episode didn't just linger on the sort of generalized note that this story could have ended on when it talks about bigotry. Because it makes a statement about breaking stereotypes and things like that. And I was sort of worried that it was going to be one of those episodes that addressed like the concept of it, but didn't really individualize it nor address how this can still appear systemic or still like be an incorrect way of addressing these issues. Again, I'll have to talk a little bit about this more in spoilers, but I liked that one of the criticisms that I had with the episode as I was watching it, it was immediately addressed in one of the final scenes of the episode. And so I liked that the show, when addressing things like bigotry and prejudice, is not just doing this typical Star Trek, we're gonna speechify and make one big grand speech, an example of something, and then let it sort of go at that, but sort of casually addressing the own problems with the way the story itself, this episode, addressed the issue. And I just like that it was sort of self-reflexive and self-critical of the very story that we were being told. And it just showcases to me the intelligence and thoughtfulness that these writers are really putting into the story in terms of the allegory in which it's telling. Not just the story going on here, but really thinking about the implications of what this story has in terms of its larger discussions around issues that are directly affecting today. And that just, Oh, that just so encourages me because that's what Star Trek needs. It's one of my biggest criticisms of old Star Trek, as much as I love it, is that sometimes it missed the full extent of the implications of its allegory. And this show is showing me that it's not doing that, at least so far, and I really appreciated it. Even if it doesn't have time to delve into all the nitty gritty of it. So overall, another fantastic episode of this show, and it is this show is just keeping going on a trajectory of being amazing, in my opinion. But with that being said, let's dive into spoilers, hopefully the, the, the word's right there, uh, and then we'll go talk about all the stuff that I, uh, I have a lot of thoughts on very positively. Okay, I have a lot to talk about here, so I'm gonna try and just touch upon everything that I possibly can, because uh, there's a lot and it's all really good, and I just love that there's so much to chew on with this episode, so very excited to get into this. So the storyline that we're dealing with here is we have Illyrians who are a group of aliens that have genetically modified themselves. We are at one of their colonies that has been abandoned and the Enterprise is here trying to investigate what happened to these colonists, but there's ion storms that hit the planet all the time so they can only spend so much time on the planet. And we start off the episode with the crew needing to quickly get off the planet because an ion storm is coming at them. And I loved a lot of this initial setup that we have here because not only is it again showing the competency of the crew, but we also get the competency of the crew on the Enterprise with Hemmer helping Una and crew get teleported back up to the ship. Because while there's a bunch of ion stormy nonsense going on here, we immediately see that Hemmer is just confident, knows exactly what to do, and he can like push the right buttons in order to get the crew back on the ship. I just, I really love just seeing the competency of all of that. It does lead me to one little niggle that I have in the episode of like, why would they not have had better safety procedures in place to like set up exactly when they needed to leave before this ion storm was going to cause a problem and Spock like should have known better than staying on the planet which leads him and, him and Pike to having get stuck on the planet. So a little bit of a little bit of a conceit there in terms of safety concerns being a little lax but that's Star Trek isn't it? Safety concerns always seem to be pretty lax on these ships uh, but I, I did like seeing the competency of Hemmer in this opening moment. So I'll come back to Pike and Spock in just a minute but staying with the crew of the Enterprise for the most part uh, we get the crew just getting, I guess, a get, little bit orgasmic for light. It like reminded me of the game in The Next Generation where like everyone has the, the, the game on their faces and they're all getting like their O faces anytime they play it. Like this is what everyone's feeling with the light here. It's like, oh God, the light on my skin, it feels so good. And just Lance like literally harming himself to go through, to get to the light was, uh, was just a little bit of a fun thing to see. And I liked, we got to see Mbenga throughout all of this as the doctor being very confident and just like trying to be in over his head with this situation being like, oh my God, I gotta deal with this. I gotta try and help these people. Like just, and Benga throughout the episode, just being a very competent doctor and just sort of being in over his head with everything, but trying his best to like help people and be a self-effacing doctor. I thought it was great. It was nice to see a little bit more of development of his character. Also at the end of the episode, I'll just say it here, Nurse Chapel sort of saying like, I know I'm a good doctor and her confidence. Loved that. Nurse Chapel, even in the small bits that she has throughout episodes, just constantly makes me happy. I think she might end up being a favorite character for me on this show. And I also like that Una during all of this was also showing her competency, like holding on the ship with Pike's not there, sort of directing like the quarantine and lockdown at certain points. Like again, competency, like just competency all around this episode was nice to see. 
But then we start to see that Una is lying a little bit about something that happened to her because she is clearly affected by this light too, but doesn't seem to be as bothered by it after sort of it's expelled from her body. And so we know that something's up. We don't know exactly why. And I started to think initially that this was because that she was being affected in some way by this light disease. But eventually we learn that it has something to do with herself specifically. And I like the subtle ways that it starts to come up throughout the episode. Because we see that she's fine from Dr. Mbenga. But then we get a nice little scene between her and La'an. And as we already know from the pilot, her and La'an already have a history. And Una sort of looking into what's going on here and looking into the genetic modifications that the Illyrians were making down on the colony is a possible source for what's causing this. And in her conversation with Laon, you get the sense of their history that they have together, of them being friends and knowing each other, but having a little bit of a falling out. And I like that familiarity that we get to see in that sort of like evocation of backstory that we get in these scenes without it being directly stated and told to us. We like get that history just through the way they interact with each other, which is just great writing and great acting. But then we also get a little bit of telling with the fact that La'an, that she has the last name Noonien Singh, which we obviously know relates to Khan Noonien Singh, who was the genetically modified leader that we saw during the eugenics wars who comes up in Space Seed and Wrath of Khan. But I like that we learned that La'an has a prejudice against genetically modified people or just genetic modification in general because of that history. Because she, as we later learned, that she was made fun of for it, that she was, you know, harassed for it. And so it's led her to have her own prejudice because of her last name and her history to it. Um, and, and I just really like that she, she herself, that she had that sort of prejudice and bigotry within her uh, that comes out of a very real and understandable place within Star Trek lore, but also in her personal history. So that was just really interesting to see. And I like that Una, really briefly says like I would think that you would be over this sort of prejudice no better uh, but we don't like get her stating it outright before Laon has to uh Laon starts to come down with this sickness as well so all of that was just really good writing but then we get a scene where Uhura wakes up and finds her fellow cadets also like freaking out like worshiping the light uh at one point which is kind of funny to see and I also really love that we got to see in this scene it's a little subtle thing but I, I just really liked it that number one as a cadet she's sharing a room with several other cadets because mostly in live action Star Trek we've seen like people getting their own individual quarters and the only time I've others I think we've seen people sharing a room is Burnham and Tilly over on Discovery and Tilly also being a cadet so that making sense uh there as well but I like that we saw that also uh, Uhura was sleeping in a wall, like she had a wall room, which makes me think of Lower Decks where all the Lower Deckers over there that are also sleeping in their little wall cubicles. So I was just sort of like, oh, that's a nice little like uh, connection there and just the set design uh, I thought was kind of nice. But ultimately we get to see Una investigating a little more, nice to see her competency there, and learning that this disease travels on light. So we shut down all the lights on the ship, or at least most of them, in order to stop um, the disease from spreading. I also like that we got an earlier scene with Hemmer coming in and messing with the transporter and Mbenga getting very frustrated with that leading to what we eventually learn at the end of the episode. But also showing like uh, Hemmer's like very uh, gruff attitude about things. I also like that one point earlier in the episode where like they're called the quarantine and everything sort of happens that he just snaps his fingers and everyone sets into motion. Like Hemmer just got his engineering crew down pat. Also, by the way, should be mentioned that this was obviously written during the pandemic. So it's like clearly some evocation of lockdown and stuff around the writer's minds with all of this. So cool to see that little connection addressing subtly some of the stuff that we're dealing with t in today's world. But then we get a really uh, out there scene where Hammer is literally trying to transport some of the of the planet's mantle in order to have some light and it would like literally murder him because it's thousands of degrees uh, on the ship. And I thought they would just show again how like good of an engineer Hammer is, but how dangerous this disease is. And Uno stopping him, but then just picking him right up and just dragging him to the uh, the sick bay. And I initially thought like, wow, how the hell how the hell is she able to do that? But that becomes the reveal, right? Because the reveal is that Una is actually Illyrian and that she's also genetically modified. Which does, by the way, draw upon some of the non-canonical Star Trek lore because there's been books and things that establish that Una was Illyrian. So I'd like to see the writers sort of drawing on that sort of non-canon stuff like they did for her name. But also, I really loved that this tied into, and, and Benga and Una have this direct conversation about this, about how there's a prejudice against genetically modified people in the Federation because of the outlaw against genetically modified people and the eugenics wars in human history. And that Mbengo directly causes a link that like, there's always been prejudice and this is just a new form of it. That this is just a form of prejudice that we see within the Federation and it's not okay. Even if there's understandable roots for why it's caused that way, 
It's just a new prejudice. And this is something that we've seen throughout Star Trek, not just with genetic modifications, but over in Next Generation and even Star Trek Picard with things like the synth ban that we saw in those shows and the prejudice against people like Data or holograms in Star Trek Voyager. Like these uses of, these like evolving prejudices within the Federation and Starfleet, and this one just genetically modified people being a relation to it. We also saw this too is in the characters like Dr. Bashir in Deep Space Nine, um, which was also like a nice little tie in there, not directly, but kind of hitting upon those same themes that we saw with Bashir's character as well. But this ties really nicely into the Pike and Spock stuff going on, on the planet, because standard uh, on the planet weirdness stuff going on with them because they learned that these these aliens in the ion storm, these energy beings, and that ultimately saved their lives in a heated moment. And I like that Pike also is feeling like he can't, he's frustrated because he can't do anything to help his Enterprise crew. He's stuck on the planet. But eventually they coming to the theory and I like that it's not confirmed, but it makes sense that these aliens were the Illyrians themselves because they were working to genetically demodify themselves in order to enter the Federation. But that was happening because the Federation has a prejudice against genetically modified people without understanding, as Una later puts it, that Illyrians aren't doing the same type of genetic modification that, you know, humans were doing. That it wasn't about trying to make someone better or make a superior version and the sort of eugenicist, uh, racist implications of that. That there could be like some better version of somebody, but that they do it in sort of concert with nature. Like there are people today to, that talk about like transhumanism. That transhumanism is not necessarily like something to make someone better than someone else, but to talk about how we think about nature of humanity. Um, I think Philosophy Tube did a wonderful video on transhuman that discussed this same idea um, that I think targets this, this very topic. And so it was just cool to see that being brought up here. But because of the prejudice that the Federation has, that it leads to these people doing this horrible thing to themselves because they were trying to live up to this uh, symbolic gesture to be able to enter the Federation. So I like the criticism of the Federation's prejudice here within this episode because of that. Like, all oh, so good. But then we get a scene with Una and La'an where La'an's trying to breach the warp core to get the light to go off and have more light within her, which leads to Una being able to save La'an's life in a little bit of a wonky thing where it's like, oh, because we both got infected at the same time, I was able to help her and that my blood can help other people. So I, I thought that that was a little bit of an easy conceit in terms of the solution to this problem. But what it does allow us to show is that La'an does know about Una's backstory as genetically modified, and that it caused her to have prejudice against Una on an individual level. And they later talk it out, but Laan sort of says like, it wasn't just the light talking, like yes, I wouldn't have said it in that way, but I do have a prejudice against you because of the way I was treated, I was called an augment. And like having that prejudice against her because of it and how that the systemic problems individualize themselves and prejudice against singular people and distancing themselves even though they are technically friends. And so I like that this sort of recognition of the systemic issues also being played out individually in individual prejudices. Um, again, while also directly pointing out that this is metaphorical, but directly tied to prejudice in general as we got in the conversation with Mbenga. So just really good uh, like drawing about all the different ways that this could present itself. But then we get the wonderful ending to this episode that I truly adored because we get Una and Pike talking to each other. And Una was saying, I'm gonna resign. I lied to get into Starfleet. It was something I always wanted, um, but I lied about who I was to get in. And that obviously, again, being more representation of the systemic and individual prejudice that the Federation has. And Pike saying like, no, not gonna let it happen. Um, I welcomed the discussion to people uh, saying that you shouldn't be in Starfleet because of who you are. Um, and, I, and I love Pike being like, no, I'm not gonna call you out for it. Like, that's wrong, it's wrong to do that. And if I get called out for it too, then I will have the discussion and we will bring it to light. But he makes a mistake. And in, I actually literally wrote it down in my notes that I'm like, ooh, I don't like this implication. And the episode addressed it in a few minutes later, which I loved, which was he says, you are someone that breaks stereotypes, that you are the exemplar of Illyrians. And I was initially like, oh, is she one of the good ones? I literally wrote that down. Oh, she's just one of the good ones. Why does she have to be the best in order to break these stereotypes? That you have to prove that you are the best version of these people in order to break those stereotypes. And it's a way we see prejudice often being removed from people, like we saw with characters like Nog in Deep Space Nine. Like he was a good Ferengi. And that dispelled a lot of like Cisco's prejudice against Ferengi. But he shouldn't have to break stereotypes to be able to be accepted for who he is. And I was a little bit like, ah, I dislike some of the implications of that. I get what they're going for, but I dislike some of the implications. But then Una brought it up herself in her own log, privately, where she says, what if I hadn't been a hero? 
What if I hadn't been one of the good ones? She literally said the note that I literally wrote as my criticism, she said and called out. And I'm like, oh, I love that. And I love that she wrestles with it privately because she would like to be called a hero and she was li does like to be seen as like an exemplar of her, of her people. But that's a lot to put on someone. It's something we saw with care. It's something we saw in real life with people like Nichelle Nichols, um, when she was almost considering quitting Star Trek, and um, you know Martin Luther King came to her and said, "You need to stay on this show because you are an exemplar of people, uh, black women in this future that we can be this." And Nichelle Nichols has been open in some of her discussions surrounding um, how she felt about that. How she's like, "Yes, I, I do want to do this." But why me? Why does it all have to be placed on me? Why do I have to be the best of us? Why do I have to take this burden in order to, you know, prove that black women have every right to be here? And Una feeling that too. And I like the show calling it out, but also showing how much of a burden that places on her. That it's not something that she feels she can address with Pike. As much as we love Pike, it's something she doesn't feel like she can go to him and say. That she has to wrestle with it privately. Um, and I really hope that that is a character arc, and I'm sure it will be, that will get addressed as this series moves forward. That it will be something that she will be like, no, Illyrians deserve to be seen as full people regardless of whether I'm the best of the best or whatever, or I break your stereotypes. We all deserve to be seen as equals. And we saw that reflected in the fact that the people on Illyria, the ghosts of Illyria, themselves are suffering because of the prejudice that people in the Federation felt towards genetically modified people. It all just weaves together so well. And so I like that there's a self-criticism of Pike, who's a character we love, within Una. It's just so nuanced and so thoughtful, and I just loved it. But then this also brings us to one last little character arc moment where we learned that Mbenga imperiled everybody because uh, the reason that the biofilter just didn't work was because in the medical transporter, he's keeping his daughter, who is sick, who he wants to sort of preserve in order to keep her alive long enough to find a cure for her disease. And I thought that was very sweet, and I love that Una doesn't call, like, says, oh, it's okay, keep it fine, we'll give you a dedicated power source, but, like, don't do it again. And I thought that that was a nice way to reveal that story about this character. Um, and again, it'll probably be a backstory for the character that will get explored more and we'll get to see more of his daughter. I thought it was a really sweet ending with him speaking to his daughter. And I like that we also get a little retcon too of the fact that like you can keep people in the pattern buffers as long as you rematerialize them every once in a while. Um, which I was about to call out as a uh, canon breaking thing because we've seen in previous Star Treks, even Discovery just this last season, where you can only keep people in the pattern buffers for so long. And in episodes like TNG's Relics, where we saw that Scotty was kept in the pattern buffer for a really long time before he was rescued and it led, led to the death of his friend because his pattern had degraded. But the fact that you rematerialize every once in a while, then get re-put in the pattern buffer, that allows you to sort of stay um, stay from degrading, which I, I, I at least like that explanation of why that's happening. Um, so I thought that was very sweet, and we'll sort of see, I'm sure, more about um, Mbega's daughter going forward. Though there is probably an ethical quandary of like, what about his daughter? What does she feel about like constantly being put in the pattern buffer and not getting to live a life? But I'm sure, uh, you know, it's probably something to discuss with her. So, I, you know, we'll see how that goes. I'm curious if there's going to be discussions of the ethics of that, because I'm sure there are ethical questions. But it's an interesting story thread to pull with this character, and I'm curious to see where they're going to go with it. And that leads me to the end of my thoughts on this episode. Again, this series is knocking it out of the park. Not only is it doing classic Trek storylines in fun and new ways and episodic ways, but also drawing it out through character arcs and really showing us really wonderful, interesting character arcs that come in conflict with each other, criticizing characters who we even love, like Pike, in subtle ways, and also like using these stories that are very directly linked to Trek canon to criticize real life problems of bigotry and things like that, but also how they've appeared in Trek in general um, up until this point, and like a subtle critique on issues within Trek history. I am loving this show because it is saying everything that I've always criticized about Star Trek despite my love of it, and really bringing it to the fore, and not just like hating on it, but allowing it to be part of the fabric of the universe of Star Trek, but allowing our characters to navigate the complexity within it, and still showing the utopian future of Star Trek, but trying to push back against some of these ideas that are prejudicial within some of the ways that this series has, you know, been done over 50 years. Just masterful is honestly the best way I could put it so far. This show, so far, in these three episodes, has been masterful. You know, I, I am really in love with it. But that's my thoughts on this episode. I'd love to hear all your thoughts down in the comments below. Did you love this episode? Hate this episode? I'd love to hear all of that. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more reviews of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. I'm going to be also doing some new fun stuff on this channel in the near future, so keep a look up for that. I also have my main channel, Jesse Gender, where you can find my video essay type stuff that I do. And then I also have a podcast called Jumpgate, where I rewatch Babylon 5 with my friend Vera Wild. But beyond all of that, I just thank you for being here, you lovely, lovely people. And I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper.